Hello everyone and welcome back to the History of Scotland, episode 44, Laws, Languages and Culture. I am Fraser, your guide to the past as we traverse the misty highlands and rich lowlands of Scotland's storied legacy. In our last episode, we closed a chapter on the reign of Malcolm IV, a king whose tenure, though prematurely ended, was a pivotal prelude to the ascension of one of Scotland's most legendary monarchs, William the Lion. Today we embark on a fascinating exploration of the laws and languages and culture that shaped 12th century Scotland, a period that ceased with the end of Malcolm's reign. Our beloved Scotland, a tapestry of history and tradition, has always been a land of dynamic change and cultural confluence. During the 12th century it was no different. The kingdom was expanding, stretching its limbs into new territories and embracing diverse influences. This was a time where the foundation of modern Scotland was being laid, brick by brick, law by law, word by word. Let us start by delving into the cultures that thrived in our ever-expanding kingdom. Scotland in the 12th century was a vibrant mosaic of communities, each contributing their unique hue to the national identity. From the rugged highlands to the fertile lowlands, each region echoed its own customs, traditions and ways of life. The Highland clans, with their Gaelic roots, held on to their ancient traditions. While the Lowlanders, influenced by the influx of Norman culture, began to weave a different social fabric. This blend of traditions and customs created a rich cultural tapestry that was unique in Scotland. Language, the vessel of culture, was as diverse as the people who spoke it. The common man and woman in Scotland communicated in a variety of tongues, each reflective of their heritage and social standing. Gaelic, the voice of the Highlanders, echoed through the mountains and valleys, carrying with it the stories of old clans and ancient battles. In the lowlands, Scotland was gaining prominence, a language that would eventually evolve to become the Scots we know today. And then there was the Norman French, the language of the court and the elite, a reminder of the Norman influence that had steeped into Scottish society at this time. But what of the laws that governed of the land during this period? Scotland in the 12th century was undergoing a transformative time in its legal landscape. The amalgamation of Celtic and Norman legal tradition gave birth to a unique legal system. This system, though still in its nascent stages, began to lay down the framework for what would become the cornerstone of Scottish judiciary. The laws of the time were a mix of feudal customs brought by the Normans and the ancient Brian laws, a Celtic tradition. The blend of legal principles governed everything from land ownership to resolution of disputes, where concepts like the Ware Guild played a significant role. As we venture through today's episode, we will delve deeper into these aspects of 12th century Scotland, unravelling the complexities of its legal system, intricacies of the languages, and the richness of its culture. So, without further ado, let's embark on this intriguing journey that will not only reveal the past, but also set the stage for the future reign of William the Lion. Stay with me as we uncover the layers of history that have shaped the Scotland we cherish today. In the vibrant, ever-evolving tapestry of 12th century Scotland, the legal systems in place were as diverse and complex as the nation itself. This period, pivotal in Scottish history, saw the interwining of ancient Celtic legal traditions with the imported Norman judiciary, created in a unique landscape that would shape the nation for centuries to come. At the heart of Scotland's legal framework during the 12th century were two distinct intermingling systems, the native Celtic laws and the Norman legal traditions brought by the influx of Norman influence post the 1066 Norman conquest of England. The Celtic legal system, deeply ingrained in Scottish society, was primarily based on customary laws. These laws were not written, but were passed down orally through generations deeply rooted in the principles of kinship and community. They were flexible, adapting to the needs and nuances of local circumstances. This system was more prominent in the highlands and the rural areas, where the Gaelic culture and language were dominant. 
Conversely, the Norman legal system introduced a more structured and hierarchical approach to governance and law. This system was characterised by feudalism, a concept that organised society based on the holding of land in exchange for service or labour. The Normans brought with them the idea of a centralised authority, which was the crown, the Scottish monarch, which had the ultimate say in legal matters. This was a significant shift from the more community-orientated Celtic system and was more prevalent in the lowlands and areas closer to the English border. The coexistence and interplay between the Norman and Celtic legal traditions had a profound impact on the evolution of Scottish law. This interaction led to a dynamic legal system, reflective of Scotland's diverse cultural landscape. From the Celtic tradition, the emphasis was on the restorative justice rather than punitive measures. The Celtic system valued compensation and restitution, an approach deeply rooted in its societal and ethical norms. This perspective significantly influenced the develop of, development of Scottish law, particularly in the way disputes and crimes were resolved. The Norman influence, on the other hand, introduced a more centralised and systematic approach to law. The concept of feudalism, a novelty in Scotland, brought and about a significant change in the land ownership and governance. It established a hierarchical system, where loyalty and service to the lord or the king were paramount. This system also introduced new concepts of justice and administration, including the establishment of royal courts and the office of the sheriff, a position responsible for maintaining law and order on behalf of the king. The integration of these two systems was not seamless, and often resulted in conflicts, especially in the areas of land rights, succession and legal disarrays. However, this blend also led to a rich and multifaceted legal system. For example, in the Highlands and other Gaelic-speaking regions, local customs and Brayon laws, a form of ancient Celtic law that we'll get into later, continue to play a significant role, while in the Lowlands, the Norman system was more readily adopted. Brayon law, an ancient system of Celtic judiciary, played a significant role in Scotland's legal landscape during the 12th century, particularly in its coexistence with the Norman influence of laws that were being introduced. Brayon law, deeply embedded in the Gaelic tradition, was a complex and sophisticated system of customary law. It was characterised by its focus on restorative justice rather than punitive measures. One of the key features of Brayon law was its emphasis on compensation and mediation over retribution. The system was deeply community orientated, with legal decisions often made by Brayon, a judge who was well versed in these laws and customs. In contrast, the feudal legal system brought by the Normans was, as we know, hierarchical and centred around the land tenure and service. The system was more rigid and formalised, with a clear structure. It included the establishment of the sheriff, who enforced the king's laws, which was different from the Brayon law. So the coexistence of the Brayon law and feudal legal structure in Scotland was a reflection of the country's cultural and regional diversity. In the Gaelic-speaking highlands and the rural areas, Brayon law continued to be influential, with its principles aligning more closely with the local customs and societal instruction. In the lowlands, however, particularly in the regions closer to England or heavily influenced by Norman settlement, feudal law was more prevalent. This dual system allowed for a certain level of legal plurality, where both systems operated simultaneously, a bit in different regions and contexts. Over time, these two systems began to influence each other. The feudal system adopted some of the restorative aspects of the Brayon Law, while the Brayon Law started to incorporate some of the hierarchical elements of the feudal justice system. But in 12th century Scotland, the resolution of disputes vary depending on these legal systems in place and the nature of the dispute. Under both Brayon and feudal laws, local assemblies, lords' courts and ecclesiastical courts played roles in resolving disputes. A key element in the dispute resolution during this era was a concept of a ware guild, a practice common to many Germanic and Celtic societies, including Scotland. The ware guild was a form of compensation or blood money paid by an offender or their family to the victim or their family. 
in the case of the crime, such as murder or a serious injury. The amount of a wear guild was often determined by social status of the victim and the severity of the offence. Wear guilds served as multiple purposes in Scottish society. It was a pragmatic solution to prevent blood feuds and ongoing cycles of revenge, which could destabilise communities. By providing a structured form of compensation, Wear Guild helped to maintain social harmony and offered a way for offenders to redeem themselves without resorting to violence. This concept reflected the restorative nature of Brayen Law and was somewhat aligned with the feudal system's emphasis on hierarchy and social order. In both systems, Wear Guild functioned as a means to uphold social norms and ensure that justice was served in a manner that was respected and respected the social structure and cultural ethos of the time. In 12th century Scotland, as we know, the church wielded significant influence over both legal proceedings and moral law, reflecting a period where religious and secular affairs were deeply intertwined. This impact was multifaceted, as always, shaping the legal landscape in various ways. We had the ecclesiastical courts and canon law. The church operated its own courts, known as ecclesiastical courts, which were governed by canon law. These courts primarily dealt with matters considered to be within the spiritual realm, such as marriage, divorce, wills and morality. Canon law, based on religious doctrines, played a crucial role in shaping the moral and ethical standards of the time. The church's authority in these matters was rarely contested, and its rulings often set precedents that influenced secular law. We had the moral and ethical influence. The church's teachings and doctrines had a profound impact on the moral fabric of Scottish society. Concepts of sin, penance and redemption were not just spiritual matters, but also influenced societal norms and legal principles. The church's stance on issues like marriage, legitimacy and morality permeated legal proceedings often guiding the secular court's decisions, especially in cases where moral judgment was required. But there's obviously mediation and conflict resolution in this. The church frequently played a role in mediating the disputes, both between individuals and in the larger political conflicts. The clergy were often seen as an impartial authoritative, making them an ideal mediator for the time. This role in conflict resolution extended to advocating for peace and reconciliation, with the church often intertwining to prevent or intervening to prevent blood feuds or escalating conflicts, in line with its teachings on forgiveness and reconciliation. The church was a central hub for education and learning, as we know, including the legal scholarship. Many legal professions of the time were educated by the church, which had a monopoly on the higher education. This education often included learning about both secular and canon law, meaning the church had a direct hand in shaping the legal minds of the era, which in turn influenced the development of Scottish law. The church's moral authority meant that its views were often taken in consideration in the formulation of new laws. Kings and lords would consult with the clergy on matters of legal importance, especially those permeating to ethics and morality. In some cases, the church directly influenced the enactment of laws, particularly those related to social welfare, marriage and the protection of the vulnerable, aligning legal codes with Christian values. The church also served as a protector of certain rights and privileges. For instance, benefit of clergy allowed clerics to be tried in ecclesiastical courts, often more lenient than secular courts. The church also advocated for rights of the poor and marginalised people, influencing legal provisions for social justice and charity. But what about the languages that were being spoke to enact these laws? Well, Gaelic was the ancient and dominant language of much of Scotland, particularly in the Highlands and Western Isles. This language was deeply entrenched in the cultural and societal fabric of these regions, reflecting the traditions and history of the Gaelic Scots. It was the language not only of the everyday communication, but also of the bardic tradition, oral history and legal proceedings in areas less influenced by Norman culture. The use of Gaelic in these regions was a potent expression of cultural identity and heritage, maintaining its purity and complexity even amidst the ever-evolving political landscape.
In contrast, the lowlands of Scotland witnessed the emergence of Scots, an early form of the language that would evolve into modern lowland Scots. This linguistic shift was influenced by the Anglo-Saxon language, particularly after the influx of English-speaking populations following the Norman conquest of England. Scots began to crystallise their language of commerce, law and urban life in the lowlands, making a cultural shift. As the century progressed, Scots gained prominence and began to use in administrative documents and legal proceedings, signalling its growing importance in governance and society. Norman French, brought to Scotland by the Normans and their allies, assumed a different role in the Scottish linguistic landscape. Predominantly the language of the monarchy, the courts and the upper echelons of feudal society, Norman French was a ma maker of status and power. Though not widely spoken among the general population, its influence was profound. Norman French was a language of official documents, charters and legal texts, particularly in areas under direct Norman influence. It introduced a plethora of loan words into Scots, leaving a lasting impact on the language. Furthermore, the presence of Norman French in Scotland facilitated the cultural and diplomatic ties with continental Europe, particularly France, enhancing Scotland's position in European affairs. The linguistic diversity of 12th century Scotland was not merely a reflection of its social and political complexity, but also a testament to the adaptability and resilience of its people. Gaelic, with its deep historical roots, continued to thrive, preserving a rich cultural heritage in the Gaelic-speaking regions. Scots, emerging as a significant language in the lowlands, signalled the evolving identity of this region, transitioning towards a more mixed linguistic and cultural landscape. Meanwhile, Norman French influenced the elite in their circles and governance, played a role, critical role in shaping the legal and administrative systems of Scotland, and all of our kings, William the Lion, our dead Malcolm IV, etc., all spoke this language. This multilingual environment highlights the cultural richness of Scotland during this period. The interaction and coexistence of these languages underscored the adaptability of the Scottish people and permanently of the cultural boundaries. The linguistic landscape of 12th century Scotland with its blend of Gaelic, Scots and Norman French was not just a feature of its time, but a foundation that would continue to shape the nation's cultural and linguistic identity for centuries to come. In medieval Scotland, the linguistic landscape was a powerful force that both reflected and influenced the social hierarchy and governance, whilst also profoundly impacting the cultural identity of Scotland. Gaelic, predominant in the Highlands and Isles, as we said, was a language of the ancient Scottish clans. Its use signified a connection to the old Gaelic order, which was characterised by a clan-based social structure. Gaelic was more than a means of communication. It was an emblem of authority and heritage in these regions. The clan chiefs, who wielded significant powers and influence, often used Gaelic to assert their cultural autonomy and maintain their traditional governance structures. In the lowlands, the emergence and spreading of Scots marked a shift in governance and societal structure. As Scots evolved from its old English roots, it became increasingly associated with the burgeoning urban centres and the merchant class. This language was integral to the administration of the lowland areas, where the feudal system underpinned by Norman influence was more firmly established. The use of Scots in legal and administrative affairs, particularly in boroughs and royal courts, Courts, signified its status as a language of governance and commerce, setting it apart from the emerging and administrative elite from the Gaelic-speaking Highlanders. Norman French, spoke primarily by the nobility at the royal court, was a symbol of high status and power. Its use was confined to the upper echelons of society and was instrumental in the governance and official matters. The language created a distinct divide between the ruling class and the common people, reinforcing the feudal hierarchy that was being ushered in. Norman French influence on Scots law and administrative practices further cemented its role in governance, making it a language of authority and judiciary. Language in medieval Scotland was a cornerstone of the cultural identity. Each language represented not just a means of communication, but, as we said, 
the whole cultural ethos embodying the traditions, values and histories of its speakers. For example, for the Gaelic speaking Scots, their language was you know, about their history, their law and identity. Gaelic bards and storytellers through their oral traditions kept alive the tales of the ancestors, the tales of the Picts, the kingdom of Del Rita, the clan legends and the historical battles that fought against the Romans and the Caledonians, reinforcing a sense of belonging and continuity. The persistence of Gaelic in the face of changing political dynamics was a testament to the resilience of the Highland and Icelandic cultural identity that was being imported to Scotland. In the Lowlands, Scots became a marker of a distinct cultural identity that was different from both the Gaelic-speaking Highlanders and the English-speaking neighbours to the south. The language was an expression of the Lowland Scots' unique position in the Scottish realm, balancing the influences of Anglo-Saxon world and their own Celtic heritage. The growth of Scots literature and poetry during this period played a significant role in fostering a Lowland Scottish cultural identity. Whilst obviously the Norman French, the kings, our kings, you know, our deceased William, our deceased Malcolm the Fourth, sorry, our future William the Lion, deceased David the First, etc., all spoke this Norman French language, which gave them a sense of belonging. But what about the traditions that these, you know, these cultures brought? Well, the Gaelic Scots, predominant in the Highlands and Western Isles, were descendants of Celtic tribes and cultural deeply rooted in clan-based systems. In these societies, kinship and loyalty to the clan chief were of utmost importance. The Gaelic culture was particularly rich in the oral traditions, as we said, with storytelling, poetry and music. Simultaneously, the rem remnants of the Pictish culture, though largely merged with the Gaelic by this period, were still evident, especially in northeastern Scotland. The Picts, known for their unique arc art and symbols left an enduring legacy in cultural expressions such as the stone carving and metalwork. Their influence, though subtle, testament to the rich history that we've already covered in our episodes of Scotland's historical past. But what about the lowlands? You know, this was being influenced significantly by Anglo-Saxon and later Norman cultures, and this clan-based life disappeared Instead, it was characterised by a more urban and merchant way of living, reflecting the ever-evolving societal economic landscape of this region. And obviously, the arrival of the Normans threw everything even into more confusion, especially when kings like David I introduced feudalism, a system that was marked from the departure from the clan-based systems of Gaelic Scots and the tribal systems of the Picts. If we look back to Malcolm Campbell, when he started to introduce this more feudalised society, he struggled, and that's where some of the rebellions in his early reign popped up. The integration of Norman culture brought a lot of chivalric customs as well, and traditions to Scotland. These customs influenced the Scottish nobility, blending with the local traditions to create a unique global culture. The introduction of chivalric codes, tournaments and heraldry added new dimensions to Scottish social fabric, influenced everything from warfare to art. Think of all the Norman families that have come our way, the de Bruce family, the Balliols, etc. The interaction of Norman culture with the Gaelic and Pictish traditions was not always harmonious as we know, and often involved conflict and power struggles. However, this interaction also led to cultural assimilation and exchange, enriching Scotland's cultural heritage. For instance, the Gaelic bardic traditions began to influence the emerging Scots literature. While Norman legal and administrative practices were adopted to fit the Scottish context, Lowland clans often intermarried with lowland families, creating alliances that helped disseminate this cultural practice and line being drawn. Highlanders participating in lowland markets brought their traditions, music and stones with them, while lowlanders travelling to the highlands for trade or governance encountered Gaelic culture firsthand. Festivals, fairs and markets were common grounds for such cultural exchanges. Highlanders would bring their crafts, music and tales to these gatherings, exposing lowlanders to Gaelic culture. Conversely, lowland practices such as feudal ceremonies and administrative customs gradually made their way into highland society, especially in regions closer to the lowland-highland boundary. 
festivals, storytelling, and traditional practices played a central role in the everyday life of a medieval Scot, serving as a vital component of both societal cohesion and cultural expression. Festivals, often tied to the agricultural calendar or religious observations, were significant events in both Highland and Lowland communities. They provided opportunities for social interaction, trade and entertainment. Common festivals included those marking seasonal changes, such as the Beltine, which celebrated spring, and the Samhain, marking the end of the harvest season. These festivals were steeped in ancient traditions, with customs like bonfires, feasting and games. For the Christian population, religious festivals such as Easter and Christmas were also important, often blending pagan customs with Christian practices. Storytelling was another crucial aspect of Scottish culture at this time, as we said, particularly in the Highlands and the you know, storytellers and bards. These stories were more than entertainment, they were the living memory of the people, teaching values, history and the Gaelic way of life. In the Lowlands, storytelling also held sway, though the stories often had different themes reflecting the more diverse cultural influences of the region. If we look at it in a bit of a conclusion, the cultural exchanges between the Lowland and Highland regions of Scotland during the 12th century were a significant aspect of the nation's history, contributing to the rich tapestry of Scottish culture. The festivals, the storytelling and the traditional practices were not just expressions of cultural identity, but also vital means of maintaining social cohesion, transmitting values and fostering a sense of community. These cultural elements played a role in everyday life shaping the experiences and identities of medieval Scottish people. The church was a formidable force in Scotland. We've said this so many times now. Wielding influence not just in the spiritual realm, but also in education, literature, the arts, and the social political fabric of society. This period saw significant religious reforms that reshaped the relationship between church and the state. Started with Margaret, St. Margaret, the monasteries and abbeys played pivotal roles in cultural and intellectual life. Moreover, the church's stance on legal and moral issues had a profound impact on Scottish society. The church's influence on education was profound and far-reaching. Monasteries and church institutions were the primary centres of learning, offering education in a range of subjects from theology to philosophy to arts and sciences. This monopoly on education by the church meant that the literacy and learning were closely tied to religious institutions. The clergy were often the only literate members of society, making the church the guardian and transmitter of knowledge. In literature, the church's influence was evident in the prevalence of religious themes. The majority of surviving literary works from this period are religious in nature, including biblical translations and theological treaties. This literature not only served a spiritual purpose, but also played a role in the broader cultural and intellectual discourse. The arts in medieval Scotland were also heavily influenced by the church. Religious motifs dominated art and architecture, with churches and cathedrals being the main repositories of artistic expression. Gothic architecture began to emerge in Scotland during this period, characterised by its pointed arches, ribbed vaults and flying buttresses, a style that would come to dominate the ecclesiastical architecture. The 12th century witnessed the significant religious reforms that affected church-state relations. Previous monarchs such as our David I, Malcolm Canmore and his wife St Margaret were instrumental in reforming the Scottish Church, aligning it more closely with the broader Roman Catholic Church. The organisation structure, the Benedictines, the Sistines and the establishment of new bishoprics helped establish and enhance the church's overall structure. On the one hand, they brought the Scottish church into the greater conformity with Rome, enhancing its spiritual authority. On, but on the other hand, they also increased the temporal power of the church in Scotland. The church became a significant landowner and played an increasingly prominent role in political affairs, often acting as a mediator between different factions and advising the monarchy. Think back to Malcolm IV when he came back and was besieged at Perth. Earth. Remember, it was the church that reconciled the king and his nobles.
The monasteries and abbeys were not just spiritual centres, though, but the hubs of cultural and intellectual activity. They were the keepers of the libraries and their manuscripts, making them vital to pr for pres preservation and transmission of knowledge. Monks and nuns in these institutions were often engaged in copying and illuminating manuscripts, contributing to the preservation of literature and learning. These religious institutions also served as centres for study of various disciplines. As we said, theology, philosophy, history and natural sciences. Yes, even natural sciences. The intellectual environment fostered in these monasteries and abbeys contributed to the significantly to the cultural and intellectual development of Scotland. With the motifs of art being shaped by the church, what was the art of this area? Well, the art of this area was a blend of local and foreign influences, reflecting the diverse cultural interactions of the time. Roman-esque architecture, characterised by its rounded arches, massive stone walls and large towers, made a significant impact, particularly in the ecclesiastical buildings. This style, influenced by Norman culture, introduced a sense of grandeur and solidarity to the Scottish agricultural and architectural scene. Sculptural art in these structures often featured biblical scenes and mythical creatures, serving both decorative and didactic purposes. Simultaneously, Celtic and Pictish artistic traditions continue to flourish, particularly in stone carving and metalwork. The intricate knotwork and interlacing patterns, a hallmark of Celtic art, were commonly seen in stone crosses and illuminated manuscripts. Pictish symbols, though less prevalent, could still be found in stone carvings, reflecting the enduring legacy of Scotland's early inhabitants and our early Kingdom of the Picts. A much simpler time, I'm sure you'll agree. Literature during this period was also a mix of the written texts and rich oral traditions. The church played a significant role in the development of the written literature, producing works predominantly in Latin. These included theological treaties and historical chronicles. The introduction of paper in the late 12th century also facilitated the growth of literacy culture. Oral traditions remained strong, particularly in the Gaelic-speaking highlands and isles. These bards passed down the tales of heroes, battles and ancient myths, preserving the history and the values of the Gaelic people. The music in 12th century Scotland was as diverse as its people, with various influences shaping the evolution. The harp was a prominent instrument, especially in Gaelic culture, used to accompany the recitation of poems and tales. The bagpipe, though not yet the national symbol it would become, was also gaining popularity. Church music played a significant role, with the Gregorian chant being the dominant form in religious ceremonies. Monasteries and abbeys were centres of musical training and composition, contributing to the development of sacred music. It's important to know, though, especially things like the bagpipes, they were around the 1300s, so still some time off, but we can still relate these to the history we're going over here. The secular music often performed in courts and during festivals included both instrumental music and songs. These compositions reflected the everyday experiences of the people, ranging from love and war to work and celebration. Let's have a think of the music with its blend of sacred and secular traditions with another area where the multicultural nature of Scottish society was evident. The coexistence of the Gregorian chant with the Celtic harp music and folk songs illustrated a society that was at once deeply connected to its roots and open to external influences. Foreign trade was a significant catalyst for cultural exchange in medieval Scotland. The burgeoning trade networks, particularly with the Flemish and Hanseatic traders, brought new goods, ideas and technologies to Scotland. Ports like Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Berwick became bustling centres of commerce, facilitating the flow of foreign goods and cultural influences. The import of luxury items like the spices, silk and wine, primarily from continental Europe, had a notable impact on Scottish society. These goods were initially accessible only to the nobility, but over time they began to permeate over the social structure, influencing dietary habits, fashion and lifestyle. The political landscape of Europe, including events such as the Crusades, left a significant mark on Scottish society as well. Scotland's involvement in the Crusades was partially 
influenced by its political ties with both England and France. Scottish nobles participated in these campaigns, which we will cover in a future episode, but they were driven by religious motives, also producing opportunities for wealth and prestige. The Crusades opened up new horizons for Scottish nobles, exposing them to different cultures and ideas. Returning Crusaders brought back with them not only spoils, but also new cultural and religious influences, which permeated various aspects of Scottish life. Furthermore, the complex network of European politics, especially the relationships between Scotland, England and France, played a crucial role in shaping Scotland's foreign policy and internal affairs. The famous alliance between Scotland and France, though not yet established, helped for mutual defence against Scotland. It was a result of these political dynamics. But something we haven't really touched upon is what about the Scandinavian influence on Scotland? We've already touched upon that in a massive episode, but if we think about it in the coastal regions on the islands, the foreign impact stemming from Viking raids and the settlements from previous centuries, the Norse legacy was deeply embedded in these parts of Scotland. In regions like the Orkney and Shetland Islands, the Norse influence was evident in various aspects of life. This included the architecture where Norse styles could be seen in domestic and religious buildings, and in the maritime culture, think of Summerled in last week's episode, which was heavily influenced by the Norse shipbuilding and navigation techniques with its massive navy. The Norse legacy was also evident in place names and local dialects, which incorporated Norse words and phrases. These linguistic influences were remainders of the centuries of Norse presence and integration in Scottish society. In short, these cultural and linguistic landscapes of 12th century Scotland varied. You had your influence of the Norman, French and Latin. You then had the Celtic and Gothic nature buildings that were being constructed. You had the Gaelic-speaking bards passing on the tales of the Kingdom of the Pits and the Caledonian stance against the Roman Empire. All these cultures, all these languages, all these laws brought together a very diverse Scotland, which is probably why the Scottish kings struggled to rule at times. And it took really strong rulers such as David I to hold the entire kingdom together, to hold all these different cultures, laws and languages together. It's different than it was in England. This is a massive, cultural, diverse kingdom and it would continue to grow as such throughout the centuries to come. As we draw a curtain on today's exploration of 12th century Scotland, I hope the journey through this rich tapestry of its laws, languages and culture has been as enlightening for you as it has been for me. We traverse the complex legal fabrics into the diverse linguistic landscape and immersed ourselves in the vibrant cultural dynamics of the era. We also covered a vast terrain. This overview only scratches the surface of the profound depth and complexity of this period. But as you can see with this episode nearly being 38 minutes long already, I needed to give more of an overview, which is why I may have missed some key parts of these languages, laws and cultures. And to be honest, I could make about five or six episodes on this. And as we continue to progress throughout Scotland's history, we'll make sure to come back to this style of episode and give you an update on the cultures, languages and laws. I think it's important to set the stages for the political story that we're telling, because it wasn't just about kings and battles. It was about the common man and how all these different cultures were affecting them. But in preparing for this episode, I delved into a range of historical texts and scholarly works. Key references include Scotland, the story of a nation by Magnus Magnusson, which provides a comprehensive look at Scotland's history and the Oxford Companion to Scottish History, edited by Michael Lynch, offering detailed insights into specific aspects of Scottish life in the 12th century. These resources, among the others I've mentioned in past episodes, have been instrumental in painting the detailed picture of the era that we've explored today. Looking ahead, our historical odyssey continues next week, where we'll embark on the reign of William the Lion, one of Scotland's longest serving monarchs. His rule, following the legacies of David I and Malcolm Canmore, presents a fascinating chapter in Scottish history. Will William's reign be marked by expansion and prosperity, or will it veer towards discord and regression? The answers to these questions will lie in the intricate weave of historical events and personalities, which we'll unravel in the upcoming episodes of his rule. 
Remember, our podcasts are released weekly, with the next episode scheduled next week. Yes, that does mean we're actually doing four episodes this month apart from our usual three, but it will return back to three episodes a month starting back in January. To stay updated on our journey through Scotland's past, please follow us on Twitter at The History of SE1 and on our Facebook page at The History of Scotland Podcast. Thank you again for the new followers, reviews and group members that we have on Facebook. Your feedback is as always invaluable to us, so please leave a review on your preferred podcast platform, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean or many other great podcasting sites. Lastly, I want to extend my warmest wishes for a great Christmas. Thank you again for all the support this year, all the great love I've been receiving. It's been really, really great to come back and do this series and seeing you guys enjoying it and our platform to continue to grow. It's it's just awesome. I'm glad I runs into Scottish history as much as I am. Anyway, enjoy the holidays, enjoy Christmas, stay safe, embrace the joy of the season, and I look forward to having you all join me on the next leg of our historical adventure. But until then... Stay safe and I'll catch you all on the next one. Peace guys.